Um, I'm Jerry, and I study the genetics of luck. Now, what is that? Cancer touches us all. Your friends, your family, maybe you. And we all know people who have cancer and should do great and do poorly. And we know people who have cancer and should do terribly and they do great. And that's ascribed to lifestyle or strength of will or faith or often luck. Well, what is that? I think what luck is, is just a measure of our profound gap of knowledge between the interaction of a person, their cancer, and their therapy, and how that impacts their response. So what I need to do here first is a quick like, one-minute primer of cancer and genetics. So what cancer is, is the uncontrolled growth of cells. Now, your normal cells are fantastic about knowing when to divide and when to stop. So if you have a break in your leg or a big gouge in your arm, the cells will grow until they fill in and repair, and then they'll stop. You don't have a big you know, lump growing on your arm that you have to drag around as your cells keep growing and growing and growing. How that happens is there are genes that are responsible for turning growth on and stopping it. So you can also imagine that these are like switches. You need to grow, switch goes on, you grow enough, you stop. And what cancer is, is mutations that basically force this switch into the on position. So it grows and grows and grows and grows and doesn't stop. And so then it proliferates, it gets into bone to cause pain, it goes into normal organs and disrupts their functions, all the problems with cancer. Right? So I study leukemia, which is a cancer of the blood-forming organ. And the slides that I've shown here is just an example of what I'm talking about, uncontrolled growth. On the left is a normal bone marrow, and all I want you to get out of that is that there are different kinds of cells, you can get that by the colors, and there's space. And on the right, there's leukemia, which is just a non sheet of similar leukemia cells that's overwhelmed everything. And so if I had leukemia, if I went to the emergency room because I was sick with leukemia, I would have tens to hundreds of billions of leukemia cells at the time of diagnosis. And so I have to get therapy. Now, while I study leukemia, what I'm going to talk about next really applies to all kinds of cancers. There are basically three responses to therapy that you can have. And if one slide can depict an entire career, this slide is my career, which is either shows immense focus or is just kind of sad. You can, <laughs> you, you can, you can, you can decide. So you can have three treatment responses, and unfortunately, you don't get to decide. The physicians really don't get to decide. Your cancer is the one making that decision. Right? And unfortunately, as physicians, we're not very well equipped to tell you which pathway that your cancer is going to go on. So this is the first, which is you get chemotherapy, and your disease just dissolves, and you're cured. That's the one we want. There's the second, where you get chemotherapy, and it doesn't do anything. We call that refractory disease. In this case, we've exposed patients to chemotherapy and all its toxicity without any benefit at all. The third is the most common. You initially respond to therapy, and then your disease comes back. And it often comes back differently than the original disease. It often grows faster. It often is less sensitive to chemotherapy. And you can imagine how devastating this is to patients who've initially responded, and now they've relapsed. They've lost their real chance to be cured. It's a, it's a horrible thing to happen. But this is still, despite all of our amazing progress we've made in cancers, this is still the major problem in all cancer, is the problem of relapse. So if it's been the major problem for years and years and years, and it's still a major problem, it suggests that maybe we have to start thinking differently about what it is to cure cancer, what we really need to do, how we think about cancer and resistance. So when I started doing this almost three decades ago, the number of genes that were responsible for causing cancer, you could put on one hand. Now we know that there are scores of genes that can cause cancer, and we know that not just one mutation in one gene causes cancer, a cell actually has to get a number of mutations. And that's presumably because these functions in the cell are so important that you have backups. 
So one mutation alone doesn't do it. It takes multiple mutations to eliminate the backups to get cancer. So in this model I've shown here, on the far left is a normal cell, and then it gets one mutation, it's the kind of pinkish color, that's still going to be behaving as a normal cell. It gets a second mutation, and in this model, it takes three mutations to get a cancer. And in most leukemias, it takes somewhere between three to five mutations. With that, you get the uncontrolled proliferation of cells, all genetically identical to the original cancer. So it's almost like the uh, cancer Xerox machine has gone berserk. For those of you who are very young and have never seen a Xerox machine, ask the person <laughs> next to you. I just realized that kind of dates me quite a bit, doesn't it? Um, so you basically have, the thought is that you have billions of identical cells. Now, when cells are identical to each other, we call them a clone, for your lingo there. And so cancer is seen, was seen as kind of a monolith of genetically identical cells that takes over. Now, that model fits some of those three curves I showed. If your cancer are all composed of genetically identical cells that behave the same, and they happen to be sensitive to chemotherapy, you give the therapy, it melts away. OK, that fits. On the contrary, if you just happen to have a huge clone of identical cells that's resistant, then you give therapy, and none of those cells respond. OK, that fits as well. Where it doesn't fit is the most common that of response and then relapse. Because if they're all the same cells, why would that happen? Right? Do they learn resistance? Right? That doesn't make any sense. So the question is, is have we been thinking about cancer with that linear model I showed wrong? And it appears so. Just recently, we've found that, in fact, cancer is not one clone. It's actually many, many clones. So you get a cancer, and then you start having offspring, which are genetically similar, but different. And so you can imagine building sort of a family tree, where you have a parent cancer, and then all of these offsprings, as they accumulate more and different mutations. Now, because of this, you have many different clones, different sizes, they grow at different rates, and they're responsive to different chemotherapies differently many different clones that behave differently, you start getting in, into kind of Darwinian space. Survival of the fittest, natural selection. Because so, you can imagine now you have a very complicated ecosystem of cancer. It's not just your normal cells versus cancer cells. There's a fight in the cancer cells itself. So you have basically competition going on within the cancer. And the competition between the cancer different clones and the normal is for space, it's for resources. You have a situation of Darwinian selection. Now on the left here, I show a kind of a tree lineage diagram of a case where someone had kidney cancer, and you do the genetic analysis of that. And then they had multiple metastases, and you do the genetic analysis of all of those, and you, see, you can kind of get a family tree of how they're related. The long stock there is the parent, and those are the offspring. So if this cancer went to Ancestry.com, this is what it would see. <laughs> now, I think we're really on to something, because look at the, the branching diagram on the right. It looks a lot like the one on the left. The one on the right is from Darwin's notebook, when he was trying to figure out evolution by studying finches in the Galapagos. Looked pretty darn similar, right? What a thing I love is, this little highlighted area here, this is in Darwin's notebook. I think, it's sort of like, I think I have the most exciting biological <laughs> thought in the last 2,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think he's right, because I think this is actually how you can explain much of the behavior of cancer and how we have to think about it to actually cure it in the future. So let's go back to our model now. And instead of looking at one giant similar clone, we have multiple clones. So on the left there, the, the most biggest clone are green, we kind of call those sensitive cells to chemotherapy. And so you, little, you have your cancer ecosystem there, and then you give chemotherapy. And what that chemotherapy does is wipes out the most sensitive clone, the green ones, 
And then at the bottom there, you see the trough, you have some resistant cells left over. Now, what have you done? Your chemotherapy has basically wiped out one group of cells that was sensitive, but now the, the more resistant cells have room to grow. They don't have any competition, they've got more space, they've got more food, and they grow. And you get resistance. And then you give more therapy or different therapy, you wipe out the next sensitive clone, and the next even more resistant clone comes after that. So in this case, the unintended consequence of chemotherapy is breeding resistance. So you're in this tough situation where in some patients, chemotherapy is exactly what they need. In other cases, it actually is putting the stage forward to actually doing exactly what you'd expect for resistance. So in this case, cancer has used natural selection against you. Now, so far we've been studying this. We've done some remarkable things, but we've, uh, we're doing, you know, we're sort of like do, fighting with our hands behind our back, at least one hand. Because how we've had to do these studies thus far is basically take millions of cells, grind them up, and then do your genetics and your biology on those. So in a sense, you're averaging out all of the individual variations in cells, right? So the analogy here would be akin to wanting to know the ecosystem of a swamp. And so you drain the swamp. I hear there's a, there's a lot of interest in draining swamps these days, right? <laughs> So you drain the swamp, and then you put it in a blender. And then you do your genetic analysis, right? And you look and you say, well, it looks like there's a lot of frog in here, in this swamp. And it looks like that's a bit of a duck. And here's, here's a part of a lobbyist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ni nice shoes. Um, and you can get useful information out of that, but not really as fine as you might like. And, and just within the last year or so, we are now able to do genetic analysis and functional analysis on single cells. So you can actually get much more information, potentially, because you can actually take a sample, divide it into each single cell, and understand what the genetics of that single cell is, and get an idea about how those cells might be functioning and interacting with other cells. So you get a much more depth of understanding of what this cancer ecosystem is. And again, we're very, very early on this, and this is really in its infancy, but I think this has a huge potential in driving our understanding of the complex ecosystem of cancer. Now, there are huge questions. We're just beginning this, you know, most ideas are wrong. These might be two. One question is, how do you measure the clonal diversity, the tree? You can make those tree diagrams, but how do you, what does it mean that one looks more complicated than the other? And how does that map to how people respond? That's going to take a lot of work. Are similar trees differently? You can imagine the clonal structures being the same, but there are different genes involved in each tree. Are those going to behave the same, or are they going to behave differently? How do clones compete? Is it just a matter of you grow as fast as possible for the space you have and the resources, or do actually some clones produce substances that actually impact the growth of other clones? Is there an active competition going on? How do clones cooperate? In almost all complicated ecosystems, some groups cooperate. How do these cooperate? It's curious that in leukemia, if you use really, really sensitive techniques where you can find like one leukemia cell in a background of a million normal cells, there's many cases where patients will be cured for 10 years and have a very, very small amount of their leukemia that still persists and it persists over years, and they don't relapse. That's called dormancy, and we don't understand what that is. But one thing you might imagine, if you believe this model, is that that's a clone of cells that without helper cells, without cells that you've eliminated with the chemotherapy, they can't grow. So they're just going to sit around forever and really not cause a problem, and in fact, they just might take up some space and prevent more virulent clones from growing. And I think the most important thing is, do we need to kill all the cancer cells to cure people? If I have 1,000 billion leukemia cells, can I actually cure that with chemotherapy? That might be mathematically impossible to do. But if you understood the ecosystem enough and how these things interacted with each other, maybe you could do much more targeted therapy, eliminate the clones you need to, and not need to keep pounding on chemotherapy in people at a point where it doesn't do any good and just causes toxicity. So I think in the future, 
We know now what we think the rules of the game are, Darwinian selection. Okay, that's an old friend. And what we want to try to do is make it so that natural selection is working for us instead of against us. So I think when people walk in the door with the disease, we'll be able to fairly quickly decide whether or not they're on that one completely refractory pathway or not. And if that's they're going to be their fate, it's got to think outside of the box about biological differences between those and the other cells, use some new type of therapy to get them into a therapy response curve. Once you've given therapy and the cells are going down, rather than just let them grow back up, we're going to actually use this as, to our advantage. We're going to use this as a trap. So we're going to kill all the cells that we can that are sensitive, and then the ones that are left over, we'll actually study those cells, find out what's left over, and what they're going to be sensitive to. And then from that point on, manipulate, eliminate clones that we know can be virulent, clones that aren't going to do any harm, and let them live. This is going to be complicated. Uh, natural selection evolution has a several billion year head start on us humans trying to figure it out. But I think that in the end, this is going to be a game where we can actually change luck. We can take those patients who are going to relapse and have bad luck and do things that will make them into patients who will respond and have good luck. And doing that will be greater than how we're treating cancer today. Thanks. <laughs>